Thank you for joining me today. This is a special lesson from L4J, and we are continuing in our study of looking at the lessons that we can find in Ephesians, a letter from Paul to the Christians at Ephesus. And uh, it's just rich with so many lessons for us to learn. I love it. And uh, actually, I had not planned to do this for another two or three days. But this morning, I just got into the study so much and was uh, so blessed uh, seeing things that have been so obvious for all these years that I never saw for some reason. Um, I guess if we had a title for today's lesson, it's a detailed summary from Paul as inspired by the Holy Spirit of the church. During our camp meeting times and our meetings, it seemed to me that the spirit of unity and diversity was something that came forth, developed, and then came forth during that uh, wonderful series of meetings that we had. And not only just in words, but my heart was blessed by a better understanding that we all so, so often agree on what the important thing is, which is salvation in Jesus Christ. And uh, there are other things we don't agree on, and we fully believe what we believe in most cases. But, you know, God, that doesn't surprise God. And so this lesson today was a blessing to me and helping me, I believe, understand how God is working his plan probably better than I have in the past. I think about a few years ago, actually, I was doing some genealogy work, which I do in spells, and uh, I was also in Bible studies, and they seemed to come together as we were studying the Tower of Babel. And... Uh, I've heard so much for a long, long time about people seeking a unity among all the churches. And I think that's admirable, but I also think it requires some refining about what the unity is that we're seeking. The Tower of Babel was the first perfect place, except for our uh, Garden of Eden, where... People were in perfect unity. And look what they did and look how it affected them and look at how God's response was and what he did. The Tower of Babel at that place where they were building this tower to God, they all spoke the same language. They all had the same culture. They had pretty much a uniform belief. And what they had allowed themselves to do is turn inward to themselves. They became very selfish. Their eyes were not on God. They were on what they could do for themselves. That displeased God. And as was his purpose too, things work together, you know, for God when their people are called according to his purposes. And sometimes even when they're not, because his will is what overrides some things. And in this case, his desire was for people to go out into all the world and spread the good news of, of God and the true, true religion and the coming Savior. And it wasn't being done because they were wrapped up in themselves and their own goals. So what did God do? All of a sudden, they were each speaking a different language. They couldn't understand each other. They began to have falling out because of different beliefs. And God scattered them all over the world. And they were scattered and they were then different. They weren't in unity. They weren't alike. They were different. Did God love some better than others? No, he loved all of them. But his purpose needed to be fulfilled in reaching out to all people, to whosoever. So 
when we're searching for unity and trying to beat each other up to become worldly united, that's not pleasing to God. And in reality, seeking to be like Jesus is the way we seek unity. But also in reality, we're not going to really experience that complete unity until we're with Christ. Then we will realize the unity that he desires. In the meantime, we are to strive to be like him. And as he describes his body, that is the unity that he desires. It's the body of Christ, which is the local congregation and also the universal church of God, the body of Christ. So let's look at what God's plan is. And uh, Paul gives us this summary of his plan. his plan and uh, it's a an, um, it's an amazing plan and it's a beautiful plan but what is it in verse 10 it says this he and he's capitalized it's the first letter in that sentence but it's also capitalized because that's a reference to Jesus the son of God it says he that descended is the same also that ascended up for above all heavens, that he might fill all things. So this one that they had seen ascend 
had descended from heaven down to earth, lived the perfect life, died on the cross, was raised from the dead, and ascended back into heaven. And it, when he ascended back to heaven, he went to the highest place, the highest heaven, and he was on top. Because there is nothing more powerful. He has all power. And all can be fulfilled because of him and his position and his authority. And what did he do in the next verse? And I'm going to read the rest of these verses, then we'll talk about them. It says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now here, pastors and teachers is combined. It doesn't say pastors, comma, and teachers. It says pastor and teachers. So pastors should be teachers. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head even Christ Jesus, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that you would lead and guide us, help our minds and hearts to be open to hear from you as you teach us through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In verse 11, following the reference to Jesus who, uh, who descended the earth into the deepest of sin and went back, ascended to heaven, and went to the highest place, that all might be fulfilled is referring to him, to Jesus. It says he gave some apostles. Some of the people in the group had walked with him and had ministered with him and had, had fed the people who listened to him out of very little that Jesus blessed. They had walked with Jesus. Some had not. Some like Paul. In fact, Paul is the example. He met Jesus after Je Jesus had been resurrected. But in, in beyond them, he designated some or called some to be prophets. So some of the people who were followers of Christ were made prophets. Before Jesus came, the prophets foretold of his coming. After Jesus came, the prophets tell of the prophecy being fulfilled and how it applies today. He made some evangelists. He made some pastors and teachers. Now, each one of those have a role. We all, in a sense, are evangelists in that it's our responsibility to share the love of Christ and the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with others that they may come to know him and accept him as their Lord and Savior. Pastors and teachers. Now we look over at, uh, in uh, 2 Timothy, I believe it's the fourth chapter in verses 1 and through, one through 4, Paul is telling Timothy, preach the word. Preach it in, instantly, preach it in season and out of season. In other words, there's not a time that is not appropriate to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, that can apply to us as well, and should. When the Lord gives us an opportunity to share the gospel, we need to do it as led by the Holy Spirit. Why are those positions, why are those callings 
here. Why were they purposed and how were they purposed? The next verse says, for the perfecting of the saints. Who are the saints? The saints are people who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior by asking for forgiveness of sin and having his forgiveness applied to their sin and having received him into their body, they are baptized into his body by the Holy Spirit. And that's salvation. Now they are saints. They're called the royal priesthood. They are saints. Now, God sees each one of us as saints as being complete in Christ. because God sees the finished work. But in reality, while we're on this earth, we are to grow. And through the Holy Spirit, through our study in the Bible, we are being equipped to share and spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Perfecting of the saints means that all of those sins that we continue to commit are going to be gradually falling off as we study the word and are convicted and yield to the Holy Spirit until it, we will become more and more and more and more like Christ. And ultimately, when we get to heaven or to be with Christ, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. Now, another reason is to work ministry. Those of us who know Jesus as our Lord and Savior are called to be servants of others. When we see, and as, as our uh, need and calling is, our spiritual eyes should help us to see needs that other brothers and sisters and others outside the household of faith need, and we are to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit in meeting those needs not from a selfish standpoint, from out of a love for others and meeting their need. And in so doing, we are a witness to Jesus working through us. What happens as a result of that? The last part of this verse says, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That makes the church better. It makes the church look better. It makes the church's witness better. And it helps as the Holy Spirit draws people to Jesus Christ because people can see that we love one another. The Bible says in one place that they know you love me because they say you love your brother and sisters. So as we love each other, we are being the witnesses that Jesus calls us to be. How long is that supposed to go on? Well, it's supposed to go on as long as we can make it go on here on this earth. But Listen to this. It goes on till, this is verse 13, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. So we are to keep doing this until every one of us knows Jesus as our Lord and Savior and every other person on earth that we can reach has been reached and they know Jesus as their Savior. We are to continue to represent Christ continue to be ambassadors for Christ as we share the word and we become growing Christians to be more like Christ. And it says unto the measure of the statute of the fullness of Christ for each one of us to be like Christ for each local body, each local church to function like the body of Christ for us as a universal church, as all believers in Jesus, to function like the body of Christ, that is our unity that God desires for us to have. Why grow to be like that? And Paul makes this plain. Listen to it. We, we need to do that because that we henceforth be more no more children. We need to grow up. We need to mature. We need to become more like Christ. When we're born again, we are babes in Christ. And we need a lot of milk and we need a lot of nurturing care. And we grow up to be little children. And the requirements are similar. The food might change a little bit, but it's st still we're very immature as children. Contrary to what some people want to do is let them make decisions that 
only grown folks need to be making, but I, that's another story. The Bible really doesn't say that. <laughs> I think it. I think it's still consistent with Bible teaching, but that's, uh, I threw that in, and you know it. But why not be like children? Because children are tossed to and fro, not stable. And you can take about what, toddlers walking, they're not stable. We don't want to be like that. God doesn't want us to be like that for very long. That's part of our development as a, as a Christian. And it says another thing that happens to babies and children, children in particular, they're carried away by every wind of doctrine. Spiritually, if we're not mature, the first thing that comes by that seems a little attractive, we're going to say, ooh, let's see what, let's check into that. And the first thing you know is going to get better and better and more attractive and more attractive. And there you go. And then when you're going that way, here comes another one that's even a little more attractive and it's going the exact opposite way. You're going to go that way. The wind comes along and whichever direction it's coming from, you think it's a favorable wind. Well, that's because you're unstable and I'm unstable. And I need to grow to be more like Christ. And in growing to be more like Christ, I become more stable, solid on the foundation of, which is none other than Jesus Christ, as Brother B.B. preached during the camp meetings. What's it referring to when it talks about these winds of doctrine and so forth? It says, by the slight of men. How many people can you trust to tell you something other than the truth of what Jesus is? You can't trust anybody that's telling you something other than that. Because if it differs from the word of God, then it's wrong. And it says they'll do it. And it says they're cunning in the way they do that. They can make it sound so good. They can make it sound so justified. It says because of their cunning craftiness. Watch a commercial these days. And there's a lot of them. So you'll have a lot of chances to watch a commercial if you watch TV or even if you're using your smartphone. So how many of those commercials are just really truthful? Not many, if any. So you can't believe everything you see and hear on a commercial. You can't believe everything you see and hear about a religion. If you do, you've got to measure it with the Bible, which is the Word of God. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but we need to be careful about which Bible we use and and. And we need to make sure that it's saying the right thing. It didn't leave out the wrong things. And it says, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. <clears throat> I really don't know about you. I can guess. But I have never lived in a time in my life, and I've lived 70 something years. I've never lived a time in my life when there was so much deception. And so many people deceiving each other. And not to say anything about what we hear from the government or governments all over the world. We better have something solid to hold on to and to stand on. And we do in Jesus Christ. Is there any other solid rock? No. Jesus is the rock. And he's the rock of ages. And we need to stand on him. Now, those are things we got to not do. Those are things we got to be careful about. Those are things we're to be on guard for. But Paul doesn't leave, leave us with just a bunch of don't do's. He tells us what to do. Let's read that next verse. It says, but. So instead of all these things about staying as a baby and staying as a child, the fact that we don't need to not grow, we need to grow. And the fact that we're going to be surrounded by people trying to deceive us. Paul says, but speaking the truth, we are to speak the truth. Now that means some of us, myself included, have to speak less. But then again, we are to speak there's so many people that just say, I'm not going to say anything. I'll be better off. Well, we need some people to say what needs to be said. 
Because believe me, those people that are trying to deceive and be deceptive, they're going to be saying, Paul says, speak the truth. Speak the truth. Now, does he leave it there? No, he goes on to make it more Christ-like. Now, speaking the truth is certainly Christ-like, but the rest of this kind of finishes it. How? How are we to speak the truth? The Bible says in love. We're not to speak it as if we're mad with somebody, we're angry with them. We're to speak it in love. Our true love for them to understand and believe in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it says that if we do that, that we may grow up into him in all things. As we concentrate on speaking the truth and embracing the truth, we will grow. We will mature. And it says into him, which means we will be more like him. And it says in all things. Isn't our desire to be like Jesus in all things? Who are we trying to be like Jesus? And who is Jesus? The Bible says he is the head even Christ, even the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. That's who we want to be like. That's who we want people to see when they look at us. Now, I want to read you a precious period of time, uh, a precious description. And this is that perfect, detailed summary. If you can have such a thing as a detailed summary, this is it, where Paul gives us a beautiful picture of the body of Christ, of the church. Now, this can be applied to the local congregation. And remember, Jesus said that where two or more are gathered together in my name, I'm in the midst. So when we think about church, Let's try not to categorize it as a big bunch of people or a big cathedral or a big church. It might be, but it also might be a medium-sized church. It might be a very small church. It might be somebody's home church. And those are all over the world. So wherever it is, two or three, two or more. So if it's more than two, it might be a million or it might be two or three. So the church is what it's talking about. Listen to it. I'm going to pick my Bible up even because I love reading this. It says, from whom, and that is Jesus Christ. The last word of the previous verse is even Christ. From whom the, the whole body, from whom, from Christ, the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself, of Christ, in love. L-O-V-E. God is love. When I read this earlier, I thought of my daddy. My daddy was a more or less self-taught uh, machinist, and and I'll brag on him. He was he was really one of the best, if not the best. He was the best in our area, wherever we were. He was the best. He was a pref perfectionist, but particularly with farmers, when they needed something of the machine. Uh, area need, a related need, that's who they went to largely. When the farmers came to daddy with a need, let me tell you, they understood as they understood their machinery that those parts, particularly the gears, which is often what he was either having to press a rod out, axle out, or, or machine some gears so they work. Those farmers realized that those gears, no matter what the size, they had the had have the right ratio of gear of teeth so that they would fit jointly together so that when one the driving one turned, 
the other one would match up and would turn also. And it was a whole network of gears that made the machine work. And uh, Daddy was very precise, as machinists are. And when he cut those teeth and made those grooves, and he used micrometers a lot. I don't know what they use today, lasers probably. But anyway, when he put that gear back in on the axle where it was supposed to be, it would fit snugly with the gears that it was companions to. Now, what that's what this is describing about each one of us. Now, were all those gears the same size? No. Did they all serve the same purpose? Well, together they did, but some turned one way and some turned the other. But the machine worked because it had been fit together snugly, jointly. There was no play. You know, when, you, when you're working the machine and you hear it clacking and clanging and all that, you think, well, hey, something's about to go haywire here because those gears have to be snug and yet fluid so they could turn. Now, you think about that when you're thinking about God has put us together, just like those gears fit. One of the things over the last several months that I've come to be blessed to realize finally is that, brothers and sisters, when he, when, well, I'll say when I am, but it's also the same for you. When I am yielding to the direction of the Holy Spirit in my life, and I'm doing what God leads me to do. I don't, sometimes it's a long time, sometimes it's not very long until I run into somebody or hear about somebody else that's doing something unbeknownst to me that is such a fit to what I'm doing and what the Lord has presented to me as my task. Has that happened with you? I'm sure it has. So, you know, our effort really hasn't got to be so much coordinating it as being obedient to God. He coordinates. And that's a beautiful thing. And what Paul describes here is how God uses each one of us as little gears, if we use the analogy of a machine, to do our thing as he directs us to do. And in so doing, look at how the church, look at how the machine works. And it produces what he wants to produce. The main thing we're to do as the church is lift up the name and the person of Jesus Christ. Because in doing so, the Holy Spirit draws people to him who may accept and ask forgiveness, accept him asking forgiveness for their sins, and then become part of the body of Christ. There'll be babes who need to grow into children, who need to grow into more maturity, and they're part of the same body that we're part of. And the more people we get in, and in fact, we're to continue to do this until we get everybody in or until the Lord comes back for us. Thank you so much for joining with me. Spend some time in this chapter in Ephesians. It'll bless your heart. God bless you.